Why did the chicken cross the road? Well, there are about 8.3 billion egg-laying chickens in the world. That's basically one egg-laying hen for every human on the planet. And they produce 87 million metric tons of eggs each year, which is the same weight as 879 aircraft carriers. We've also got about 879 ways to eat all those eggs. Hard-boiled, soft-boiled, poached, sunny-side up, deviled, or in the souffle where praying doesn't collapse. We put them in cakes and cookies, scramble them for our breakfast burritos, and fry them to float in a bowl of ramen. Basically, people love eggs. Gaston eats like five dozen a day. The problem is producing those eggs releases nearly 392 million metric tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year. So clearly, we've all gotta stop eating eggs right now and shut down all the chicken farms ASAP. That's it, that's the episode. Just kidding, I didn't even get to the punchline. So why did the chicken cross the road? To get to the other side of our problems with food production, consumption, and access. Look, I didn't say it was a funny punchline. For that to happen, we're gonna need to make some changes. But we need to make them carefully, in a way that doesn't leave us all running around like a bunch of chickens with our heads cut off. Hi, I'm Miriam Nielsen, and this is Study Hall Sustainability. Eggs and the chickens that lay them have a big impact on the environment. That's because a lot goes into feeding all those billions of chickens. It takes energy to grow the corn and soybeans chickens on large farms eat. It also takes energy to regulate chicken house temperatures and transport eggs from the farm to your grocery store. And it's not just chickens. Everything we farm, from cows to corn to cotton, has some kind of environmental impact. Agriculture is one of the top contributors to global climate change. In total, agricultural activities are responsible for around 22% of global greenhouse gas emissions, making agriculture the second largest emitter of greenhouse gases behind industry and manufacturing. It's also the world's greatest user of fresh water. It takes a lot of water to keep animals fed and crops growing, and we have a weird habit of growing a lot of crops in super dry areas. It takes even more water to process that food to make it safe for us to eat. And all that water use impacts how much is available for other parts of our communities, especially since farming also creates a lot of water pollution. See, billions of chickens produce billions of pounds of waste. If it's not handled properly, that waste can impact the health of chickens and the workers who care for them. And it can pollute waterways with harmful bacteria, which further affects the health of people and fish living downstream from the farm. The agricultural industry operates in these ways because right now, their goal is to grow as much food as possible in order to sell as much food as possible in order to make as much money as possible. That helps explain why they keep going, despite Despite the problems with the agricultural industry. Like raising lots of chickens on densely populated farms seems like a great way to increase how many eggs we produce. But the growing conditions can lead to disease outbreaks that can wipe out entire farms. It's bad for the chickens, it's bad for the farmers, and it's bad for all the rest of us who want to buy eggs. And even though the industry is growing enough food to feed everyone on the planet, 733 million people around the world are still going hungry. In some cases, people can't afford food. In others, lack of access or reliable transportation to supermarkets with nutritious food increases people's likelihood of being hungry and malnourished. The agricultural industry is making a devil's bargain, which is both more dangerous and less appetizing than a deviled egg. They've accepted that emissions are just the cost of growing more crops to keep people fed. But since everyone isn't being fed, the ecological trade-offs they're making to grow more food aren't helping everyone. Meanwhile, the greenhouse gases they're releasing into the atmosphere are definitely hurting everyone. Clearly, there are problems with our current food system. But like baking a perfectly airy souffle, fixing them is easier said than done. That's because it's not like we can just stop farming or eating. Lots of people have big feelings when it comes to food and agriculture, and those big feelings tend to come out whenever anyone suggests making changes to the way we grow and eat food. Food is really central to a lot of parts of life on Earth. Survival, for one. And since so many people live in cities, large-scale agricultural operations are the way to ensure that people around the world have food on their tables. Farmers feed cities, after all. Plus, our agricultural systems are wrapped up in all kinds of other systems, like the economy and trade between countries. Take Colombia. Roughly a third of its land is used to raise cattle. Meat is an important part of Colombian cuisine, but they also export beef to other countries, like China and Russia. And the U.S. exports roughly 4 billion eggs every year to feed people around the world. They also import food like chocolate and coffee. Sharing food back and forth not only supports trade, but it has a global impact. That impact becomes obvious when we look at global conflicts, which among many other things can have devastating effects on food production and availability. For example, Ukraine is one of the world's largest producers of crops like wheat, corn, and sunflowers. But the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine impacted Ukraine's ability to export these crops internationally, which increased prices around the world, including in the United States. Lower production and increased prices have also led to increased food insecurity around the world. Globally, nearly 30% of the world's population experiences food insecurity. 
which means they can't regularly access the food they need to live. And these effects hit people from racial and ethnic minorities and economically disadvantaged populations the hardest. Access to food impacts people in other ways, too. For many farmers, food production has shaped their families and provided an income and a way of life for generations. People who work in other food industries, like chefs and restaurant owners, also depend on selling food to make money. Different communities around the world also have unique values and practices for producing and consuming food, which is called food culture. The foods we eat and the way we scramble our eggs connects us to our families and the regions where we grew up. They shape how we see ourselves and our place in the world. Sustainable solutions to food access and availability need to be considerate of all these different pieces. The environmental impact, of course, but also the way food connects to our economies, traditions, health, and more. Many communities have already started working on ways to make sustainable changes to farming. For example, Alaska has one of the smallest agricultural industries in the country and relies heavily on imported food. While that works okay if your definition of okay is that there is some food in Alaska for people to eat, it's pretty expensive. And it means Alaskans don't have as much fresh food since items need to be shelf-stable for shipping. It also means that any time there are problems with the supply chain, Alaska gets hit really hard. Like in 2022, a major egg supplier in Washington was hit with a bird flu outbreak that left grocery store shelves in Alaska empty. Prices for the eggs that were available skyrocketed. To help solve these problems, Alaskans made some changes. Local organizations applied for government grants from the U.S. Department of Agriculture to build up local food production so they didn't have to rely on farms elsewhere. With that support from the government, the Kodiak Archipelago Leadership Institute has been establishing small-scale farms and providing training for locals to run them. That way, Alaskans can farm their own food and sell it to each other, which strengthens Alaskan economies and community well-being. It also means less emissions from shipping food all the way to Alaska. But more large-scale changes can be made, too. Like some companies and farmers in the U.S. are working toward making egg production less carbon-intensive. The idea is to use less energy and feed and produce less waste. Some chicken breeds naturally eat less, which means they poop less, too. So farmers can raise these chickens instead of their hungrier, more fecal relatives. But they're also cutting emissions from feed production by feeding chickens byproducts from other industries that would otherwise go to waste, like misshapen bread, oat hulls, and broken pasta. And these changes could have positive ripple effects across other types of food production, too. Like if chickens were eating more byproducts, we'd be able to grow less corn and soybeans, which would lower the overall amount of agricultural emissions and pollution, preserving more fresh water and less deforestation and erosion on farmland. And those changes could improve entire ecosystems and the communities that rely on them. But Producing food is just one part of the food sustainability puzzle. We have to make sure that we're distributing food more sustainably, too. That means making sure healthy food makes it to everyone who needs it, which incidentally is everyone. Like by switching to electric vehicles or using alternative fuels to limit emissions as we ship food around the world. And all this is going to take governments, businesses, and individuals working together to get it done. Like governments can offer financial incentives that encourage farmers to sustainably raise livestock and grow crops. They can also put limits on agricultural emissions and pollution and fund programs that ensure everyone has access to healthy food, no matter their health, age, or income. Businesses can push for more sustainable food practices by producing and serving less meat, working with food suppliers that use sustainable practices, or buying locally sourced food when they can. And as individuals, we participate in our food systems every day, which means we can help change them too. But not everyone wants to raise chickens in their backyards, and depending on our budget, health, or location, we may not have many choices in the kinds of foods we're buying and eating. That's why big picture changes from governments and businesses are so important. But if we have the ability and means, making sustainable choices at restaurants and grocery stores can show businesses and governments that consumers want their food to be more eco-friendly. That can mean things like eating fewer eggs and more egg substitutes, because no one has to eat eggs like Gaston. We can also replace some or all of our meat with plant-based alternatives, purchase food from local farmers, or buy blueberry pies from bakeries that are transparent about their sustainability policies. Obviously, we can't stop eating or farming altogether, but we can do those things differently, in ways that also protect people's livelihoods, traditions, health, and enjoyment of food. Because lots of our big feelings around food and agriculture are valid. The food we eat and the way we eat and grow it is central to a lot of our lives. But being unwilling to change or come up with creative solutions is just kicking the sustainability can across the road, ignoring the impact in the name of achieving higher profits. And eventually, there won't be anything left to profit from. So when it comes to sustainable food, we can't chicken out. Instead, we'll need to scratch and claw and peck our way across the road to get to the other side. A future where everyone truly has access to healthy, affordable food that's good for the planet and the people and animals involved in producing it. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full Study Hall Sustainability course and earning college credit from ASU, check out GoStudyHall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment your favorite egg recipe, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.